Hello, this is Mick, the Doctor of Digital on the Aftermath and Kendra, co-parenting mentor. How are you today, Kendra? I am wonderful. I can share this with you today, Mick, because okay. when we publish this, it'll be done. But we have my dad's surprise retirement party tonight. Oh. So I am super excited about that. <laughs> well, I promise I won't tell him. So you can <laughs> sure it's a surprise. That's great. That's awesome. That's a great spent, family time. He spent 48 years at one company. That's my, crazy to me. You just don't find that a whole lot anymore. So I'm very happy for him. Echoes of someone like my father, God rest his soul. He spent all about 35 years in the same company and then he about 10 years in his own company in the same business. So yeah, it doesn't happen anymore. I certainly haven't done that. So. I haven't either, Mick. <laughs> but I you know there's another reason I'm excited today too. And it is Why? because, and this will be passed, but Hopefully when people are listening, they can go to YouTube and find it. But if you go to We The Parents Movie, by the time we publish this podcast, it will be live. And it is a film, a documentary where several of us parents and grandparents have come together to tell the stories of what's happening in family court in the U.S. And I'm just curious, that do you know anybody that is featured in that particular? <laughs> I might, Mick. <laughs> oh, who, who might that be? It, it's interesting. A lot of people are, are like, oh, you're in the movie. And I am in the movie. It's a sad reason for why I'm in the film because alienations happened to me. However, I know that my story is not just mine. I'm speaking for all of the parents out there that go through this. And I want to be an influence in my story to change what's happening in the law. So that's why I'm on the film. Understood completely. And that's exactly what I was going to mention as well. If you didn't, because we always have something about our supporters and sponsors. And of course, if you want to sponsor a support program, we definitely would like that as well. But got to mention, We the Parents is coming out. So thanks for mentioning that. Yes. Very good. So this is the Aftermath. The purpose of the show is to educate and to inspire you. Everything that is wrong with families today are the hard topics that we discuss. Both of us have been subjected to the harsh reality of the trauma of custody battles. But we have not been alone, for example, such as the documentary, We the Parents. Did you know that somewhere between 11 to 25 percent of divorces involve children experiencing parental alienation? Parental alienation is not a recognized mental health disorder in the DSM, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders that serves as the primary guide for diagnostic and treatment of disorders used in the U.S. However, parental alienation is included in the ICD-11, the International Classification of Diseases. While definitive numbers are elusive, available research suggests an increased risk of suicide among fathers after separation or divorce compared to the general population. Some studies suggest a two to fourfold increase in suicide risk. During this episode, we'll discuss these and related issues to understand more and how we can mitigate the unfortunate fallout from parental alienation, separation, and divorce. By the end of this episode, you'll be better equipped to know what to do, and we'll be encouraging you to contact our special guest today, parental alienation and mental health expert, Dr. Ben Hine from the University of West London. We'll be back in just a moment with Dr. Hine. Welcome to The Aftermath, a podcast that rips the band-aid off the collective scars of divorce, custody battles, and the trauma of family drama. Kendra Ryber and Mick Smith pull back the curtain and explore stories that put the heart-wrenching puzzle pieces together with inspiring stories, notable experts, and actionable tips. Let the healing begin. Let's welcome our special guest today, Dr. Ben Hine from the University of London. Ben, how are you today? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. Thanks for having me on. You bet. Yes, so welcome, we had, Ben. We're excited to talk to you. 
You bet. So we've got a number of questions to fire at you, if you don't mind, but we're very curious to know more about your background. So, for example, could you share your personal and professional journey that led you to specialize in the area of parental alienation? How has your personal experience influenced your professional work in this field? Yeah, it's <clears throat> it's a strange story because the the work and my professional kind of role and my professional life actually informed my understanding of my own experience. And a lot of people who get into psychology, they have a particular thing that they get into the field because of, and then they might do their, their, their dissertation on it, and then they do their PhD on it, and they make their whole life's work. It wasn't like that for me. I only heard of the term parental alienation about three or four years ago. And I've been researching in domestic violence for nearly a, a decade. And it was through a piece of research that I was doing with my colleague, Liz Bates, who works on male victims in, in the UK. I was doing a piece of work on men who had experienced kind of issues with their children being used against them after kind of family breakdown and as part of violence, but it wasn't called parental alienation. And we ran this study it was a survey of 100 and over 170 fathers. And it was the first time in my career, this was in 2020, a quiet year, as we remember, when I was sat in my home kind of reviewing the data and I just couldn't do it. I kept stopping. I kept being really distressed. And that wasn't very common for me because I've worked with lots of different data sets that are distressing in their own way and never really had that where I couldn't do it anymore and realized it was because I was seeing myself in the data and having conversations with Liz she said why don't you explore this more and do some autoethnography and look at your personal experience and how it's how it can inform the work and everything grew from there which has led me to both professionally and personally take a deep dive back had lots of interesting conversations with my dad about everything that happened and everything that I was led to believe about him and everything that I've been told. And it's been a real kind of crazy journey, actually, the last kind of three or four years of, yeah, really learning, healing in a way, and also sorting out some of the things that, that I did believe that maybe were unfair on my dad. And uh, we ended up co-writing a book chapter together on our experiences, looking at like how we'd remember different things. And uh, yeah, and obviously wrote the book last year, which was a, a huge thing for me. But yeah, it's been a really strange journey actually, where the professionals inform the personal and then the personal can inform the professional and lots of back and forth. But yeah, I'm glad I stumbled upon it anyway. Okay. Yeah, very I want to follow up a little bit on that because Here's what I find really fascinating. I've talked to some other folks who are in the field as you are in applied yeah. psychology, but it's really interesting that it took some enlightening to get to that point to recognize it yourself. And so my point here is that if you're a person who is an expert in applied psychology and it wasn't obvious to you, I'd also like other people to start thinking about it. And that's why I think your work is so important that yeah. you're a person who knows this firsthand and yet it took a while for you to realize your situation. And I think it can really help other people who are not experts in this field to recognize some of the signs. So I'd really like to just to mm -hmm. elaborate a little bit about how that process took place. Yeah, sure. I mean, that was one of the, I was saying to, to Kendra a minute ago, that was one of the really key aims of the book was to try and make it as accessible as possible for someone who maybe is right. heard this or, or hears it in passing and, and thinks, so I want to read more about that. Um, and as well as that, doing things like I've just started doing kind of some TikTok creation around the topic and just to really get it out there because, yeah, you're absolutely right as a child in that situation and then as an adult I hadn't uh, I don't know I just viewed it as part of my life growing up like it was just my experience it wasn't something that I could label or say was abusive mm -hmm. or any of this terminology that we have at our disposal as psychologists I just I used to tell people my life story and they 
could be like, what has happened to you? And I just thought, oh, I just have a very colorful life story. And uh, it's only through being equipped with the kind of knowledge and then meeting wonderful people like Jennifer Harmon and Bill Burnett, and who I know you're going to have on the show, and, uh, and others that, you know, I've been able to, through my work, build an idea of what happened to me personally. And I think a large part of that is because it's stuff involving kids and kids can be very easily manipulated and led and told a certain thing and then they grow up and that's just what they believe. And some of the conversations that I had two years ago with my dad, and I'm over 30 now, but it was like life altering. It was like fundamentally rewrote a lot of my history and my understanding of everything that had happened because it's very easy to make kids believe one thing or another or a certain a certain uh, image of someone yeah it's I'm lucky in a way because I got access to through my work I've naturally got access to all this information and I've started to piece together the picture but like you said that's someone who is a psychologist who's educated, who has the time to do that and now I want to try and help other people do that in their day-to-day -day lives. Yeah. Ben, I think it's very interesting because we typically have on a parent from a parent's point of view where they've been alienated. And so you are the child that has been alienated from your father mm -hmm. and you mm -hmm. recently connected, I would say in the last two years, is what mm -hmm. you just said. What did that look like from what fears and hesitations did you and your dad have? as you reunited or what did that look like for both of you? it's interesting in my case because we my my father's case custody case ended really strangely and that the case was dropped for various reasons which i i go into in the book and things where i was actually i actually lived with my dad for since i was eight years old but because of the situation that had happened there was almost this kind of reverse process then during the custody case, there was a lot of alienation towards my dad. Our relationship was attacked and disrupted, and I didn't get to see him. I got to see him every other weekend or less. And there was lots of things that I was built up to believe about him. And then when I went to live with him, we had a kind of okay relationship because he was able to immediately uh, be shown and to show himself as not someone that was like a terrible person, but there was still lots there in, my, in the back of my mind about what I've been told. So we had like an okay relationship. And as part of that kind of trauma from that time, there was still an issue. Sorry, let me just move. I love your cat. your cat. That's great. <laughs> I could just see her in the background. She's distracting me. She had to make an appearance. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and then there was an issue with the fact that they then didn't want anything to do with the side that had conducted the alienation. So they shut them out and I was placed in a difficult position. And then when my mum passed away, my mum was very ill and she passed away when I was 18. It just was the situation where I was on my own and nobody was there. I've always had a really very subtly difficult relationship with my dad or I had done and then yeah in the past couple of years and it was a yeah it was like really nerve-wracking mm -hmm. to go to my dad and say be, and the reason it was is because I know he had still been protecting me from the behavior of the alienators for a very long time because what I had been doing before I got into this in work is from about seven or eight years ago, I had been having like therapy, but I didn't know it was targeted. I wasn't like, I've been alienated, I need therapy for it. I was just having general therapy because I was really struggling and struggling with grief around my mum, etc. But part of that was exploring the anger that I had towards my dad for not coming to the hospital and those kind of things. And I'd been to him a few times to say, I lay this at your door, what are you going to say about it? And even then he had just said, yeah, I'm the bad guy because he knew I wasn't ready. Mm -hmm. So there was a real kind of, yeah, we had a, like, a big conversation a couple of Christmases ago, which was really nerve wracking because I basically said to him, tell me your story. 
honestly. And I didn't know what I was going to hear because I didn't know how far it was going to align with the understanding that I had of him. And it turns out there were a few really big areas of disconnect that I had to reconcile in my own mind. And that's really difficult because you have a certain worldview and you have a certain idea of what people are like and what they've done. And if that changes when you've thought that way for 20 years, it can be a big, big schism. But it was mainly nerves, uncertainty about what you were going to hear. But I know for a lot of children who haven't had any kind of ongoing relationship, it can be even more uncertain, nerve wracking in some cases, scary because they've been built up a picture of this person, sometimes really dramatically negative. They're going to hurt them. They're going to, they're going to uh, harm them in some way. They, some of the stories you hear are incredible. Yeah, I know a lot of people who've reached out are really trepidatious, and then they do, and then they meet this person that's nowhere near as uh, hor- horrifying as they've been led to believe. I think all children, though, are colored by this kind of confusion. And it's really, it's unsettling and it's really difficult to deal with. I think if you definitively know someone's this way or that way and you've had proof and you meet them and they conform to that, I think if anything, that's less unsettling than this idea of really just not knowing what really is reality. It's, yeah, it's really difficult. You bring up a couple of good points. I like how your dad approached it and he knew you you weren't ready and he didn't divulge everything because I think sometimes parents can make that mistake. They can hold grudges. They don't understand why the kids don't figure it out when they immediately turn 18, why it doesn't just yeah. click, right? Yeah. So I think he did the right things and I w- definitely want to bring attention to that for our listeners because I mm. think a lot of a parents are like I said, in defense mode, they don't understand. There's a lot of blame for the children not understanding immediately as they grow up. And your dad approached it, right? Yeah. And just to speak to that, that that actually, he did that later on, but the initial reaction was exactly that. So when, when the case was dropped and I went to live with him, I would argue the greatest damage was actually then done because of his response to everything that had happened. Because he then basically said, we got nothing to do with these people anymore. They're actually the bad ones. So it was almost reverse alienation, which for me was... Wow if anything, more damaging, because then I had zero support system in place to deal with my mum, who was terminally ill. Um, And so as much as my relationship with my dad was damaged, my relationship with my mum, who realistically, I only then had 10 years with, who who I didn't know that at the time, but that limited time that I then ended up having was hugely damaged by that kind of reactionary response. Now, when I talk about this, I also say, look, I get it. I'm a parent now. I I couldn't comprehend what it would be like to have someone limit and interfere with the contact between me and my children or paint a picture. I get that. The worst thing that you can do, however, is become part of that problem. Mm. And so the advice, the only advice I ever give, mainly because everybody's case is different, so it's hard to give uniform advice. But the only advice I ever give is you just have to commit to demonstrating that you are a safe, loving parent to your child. And that's the only thing you can do. don't get involved in the other person's narrative or try and counter it other than to just continually and continuously show you're a safe, loving parent. That's all you can do. Because sometimes if you buy into that narrative, what you're actually then doing is reinforcing what's being said about you. So you're actually making it worse. Mm-hmm. It's, and that was the case with my dad because I, it really reinforced this picture that had been painted of him as this really heartless guy who'd left my mum which wasn't the case. But then when he turned around and said, I don't want anything to do with her, I was like, there you go. Yeah, no smoke without fire. And it made things worse. It's difficult, but yeah, I would agree with that 100%. Thank you for sharing. I think that's very good insight that you saw both perspectives with your dad. And that was that's very interesting. I did not know that. So thank you for sharing. I think that's helpful. And I'm, Mick, I'm sure you can relate because you had very similar circumstances with your ex passing away so it it comes perilously close to my situation yeah because Mm -hmm. my wife had passed away and then daughters reunited and then we spent quite a bit of time about 10 years together but it's almost exactly the same scenario mom passes away dad's the only one and 
goodness knows what she was told and what was yeah. transpiring during this period of when she was taken away. Yeah. 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 We've mentioned a couple times. First of all, I want to bring attention to the listeners again that this is international. It's an international issue. It's not just a U.S. I know at the very beginning we talked about having a U.S. film, but this is an international issue. I know I'm friends with people in Australia and Canada and London and everywhere else, right, that's going through this. And we've had different people on and on our podcast. And in addition, it's more of a psychologically damaging to the child versus some people just think it's just a custody thing and they don't get, why don't your kids want to see you? They just don't understand what's behind it. My parents, God bless them as grandparents, they still don't get that it's more psychological at this point rather than just reconnecting and everything will just be like it was four years ago and it's not going to be. So I think your book, which we've talked about a couple of times, and I have it on screen here for those that are watching the YouTube, it's called Parental Alienation and it's a guide. And I cannot tell you how great of a job you've done on this. It just walks it through everything from the mental aspect of the children, what's happening from the parent that's doing the alienation, how the targeted parent then that's receiving the alienation on the other end, how what they're experiencing, what the child experiences as they even grow up and some of those things. So it just walks through. It's a, what we'll call it a mid-level. It gets into some detail, but not enough that you get lost in it. You understand, mm -hmm. I think, all aspects of it because it touches so many different aspects of our lives. And I just think it's so well-written. So kudos to you. I think Thank it's you. amazing. Thank you. If we can jump into just a question from it and starting off with it, can you identify the ways in which parental alienation can be enacted and how we measure those and then how more importantly, how we get those tools in front of the judges and the mm. courts so that they can actually utilize that information? Mm. Yeah. <clears throat> we, we discuss, I mean, there are, there are individuals, wonderful individuals, who are best placed to really get into the detail and the weeds about how far we've come in terms of recognizing and categorizing the different kind of behaviors. And uh, you've mentioned, uh, we've mentioned Bill, Bill Burnett, who's going to, uh, you said, come on the show and talk about that as part of this five factor model. I think so. There are 17 established alienating behaviors. I won't even attempt to try and list all 17. But the key is that some of them are obvious and some of them are not. So some of them are more explicit and more, much more easily understandable. And as happened in my case, geographical relocation or what most people would refer to as kidnap is a much more obvious one than say certain kind of campaigns of denigration and bad mouthing which can be much more subtle, or there are other examples like changing a child's name without letting the person know. So there are lots and lots of different ways that they're enacted. Some are explicit, some are more subtle. The misconception is that some of the more explicit ones are the most damaging, which is not the case at all. It very much depends on how each behavior is enacted as to its damage rather than what the behavior is. So, for example, I talk about in the chapter I wrote with my dad about the fact that because my dad loves sport so much, I was shown away, I was pushed away from sport in order to break that relationship. Now, that on the face of it might seem that something is not that damaging or you weren't allowed to do a lot of sport. Is it really that damaging? It's actually one of the things that's probably persisted the longest in terms of the wedge in my relationship with my father. So, it's not necessary that the explicit nature of the act is correlated to its damage. And crucially, there are lots of things that are currently misrepresented or misconstrued as being alienating behaviors by people who are acting in bad faith, trying to discredit alienation. And they're saying, oh, OK, so if you uh, you call your partner a jerk when you break up, that means you're an alienator. Mm -hmm. No, it doesn't. We absolutely know that's not the case. The behaviors of very clear in terms of they have to be extreme enacted over time and they have to be multiple behaviors operating at one point in order for it to be uh, alienating behaviors mm. it's really this case 
all of them are defined by behaviors that seek to attack or undermine or damage that relationship between the child and the other parent. And uh, as outlined in the book, and as people who've experienced it know, it's hugely damaging. It's a big issue, massively prevalent. I've just uh, I heard talking about some Mick talking about some stats. I've just finished a, the first study here in the UK on a representative population of parents who've separated or divorced, and between 39 and 59 percent of those parents in our sample had experienced some form of alienating behaviour. So it's rife when people separate and divorce. Yeah, that's what we mean when we're talking about alienating behaviors is those things that are specifically designed to, to attack and that fall out of the realm of what we might say is normal or typical, either parenting or uh, um, kind of acrimony in separation. Hmm. Thank you for sharing that stat. I wrote that down. That's very interesting. Unfortunately, I feel like that's growing. If we would have yeah. probably done this five years ago, we probably would not have seen that stat as high. So it's part of that is awareness, because as you increase awareness of any phenomenon, you have more people reporting it. It's yeah, also probably. really country specific and culture specific as well. And different systems will invite different levels of PA. I think if you replicated that study in the Scandinavian countries, for example, you would see a much, much lower rate because of the way their systems are constructed mm -hmm. versus, for example, UK and, and US. And then you can extrapolate it to places that are even further behind where they don't really even have proper awareness of the issues and the types of behaviors for developing nations or newly developed nations. Yeah, there's a lot of work still to be done in terms of awareness, that's for sure. Oh, yeah. Thank you for what you're doing so far. I try. I wanted to describe a scenario, <clears throat> excuse me, and then come to a, a question, but this is a typical thing that happens, and that's the process of trying to get across an answer. So in speaking of many parents and their experience, most of the severe cases are textbook cases, starting with some situation of false allegation of abuse, which leads to a protection order and then a long separation from children. That separation then is used to create a false narrative in the child's head that causes the child to have a once wonderful relationship with the parent become a terrible picture of what life would be like with them again. Could you speak to the parents who need to discipline their children, which is an ordinary thing that all parents have to do, and how that type of physical altercation can enforce a point and how that can be used against them in court to start this horrible chain of events in motion. Mm. Again, it's very different. It, it's interesting to speak on this particular issues from across the pond, as it were, because we the answer is, is very different depending on where you're coming from. For example, we don't have any kind of corporal punishment etc is is banned in the UK so you would never have a situation where uh, the law certainly deems it unnecessary for a child for a parent to physically physically discipline the child so you might not get that trajectory I think what I would take from that scenario is around how behavior translates once you get into a court setting and I think one of the issues, whether we take that specific example of a, a parent who has, has disciplined a child through physical means, or whether it's any kind of behavior that in the context of when it occurred was seen by both parents, one of the parents, et cetera, or those involved as typical or normal or okay as part of a package of parenting can often be changed and skewed when you then get into a, a court setting. So I think for me, the message there is about keeping people out of the family court system in the first instance, because as soon as they then get into the family court system, that's when we start to tend to go digging around for examples that when taken completely out of context and, uh, and out of the situation in which they occurred can be framed in any manner of which, of which ways. 
Now, that's not to say that if a parent is being abusive, obviously that should come up and that's yeah. what the court should be focusing on. But too often we are seeing a situation where a behaviour or something that has happened as an isolated incident or in a particular way or at the time wasn't seen as that is then coached to be presented as abusive behaviour right. by the professionals involved. So I think it's about keeping people out of the justice system in, in the first instance where possible. It's about educating and in, in, even legislating in terms of what those professionals within the court system can and cannot do and coach and ask for and etc and also more broadly and generally changing our cultural mindset to separation and how it shouldn't how we should try and keep it wherever possible from falling into that classic acrimony versus gladiatorial type uh, setup that we have at the moment because you're absolutely right when you do have those circumstances where then a court process is enacted and delay which is symptomatic of the court process is invited you then have a situation where alienation can flourish and uh, and it could be utilised. And that's the same here in the UK as well, when cases are, are started based on a domestic abuse allegation, you can have a two, three, four month delay between the initial hearing and the, the uh, sorry, the, uh, the case being logged and the initial hearing, in which time there'll be a, an order in place where there's no contact with the child courts should be there to protect children and they play a vital role in doing that and there are plenty of circumstances where parents need to go to those institutions in order to protect the children I have no qualms about that whatsoever mm -hmm. I feel that because of the nature of the system and the way that it's set up and the especially in the US but in the UK as well the monetary incentives to create cases, drag evidence in that really shouldn't belong there, to create things sometimes out of nothing, um, and to prolong cases as well. That's another key because it's often not in those professionals' best interests to make cases resolve quickly. It's a breeding ground for exactly that type of trajectory where you have someone who has been doing their best, is a good enough parent, may have engaged in x y and z but is not an abusive person being presented as such in court unfairly and we do see that happening and that is an issue you know this kind of reminds me of something like okay i'm not an expert in human behavior but i know the strange and bizarre and wild things that people do but to flip that it's very difficult then to define what's normal so if you're doing some sort of normal parenting kind of thing mm. that's why i think it's the strength of your answer to that question because mm. the normal then in a courtroom setting becomes completely out of context and completely outrageous based on the fact that a good percentage of normal parenting mm. takes place in terms of discipline and in terms of boundaries and in terms of guidance and direction mm. that's what parenting is However, in the context of a court, then it gets completely misrepresented to become mm. something that it's not protection, and, uh, abuse, yeah. fine. Yeah, and uh, and and it's it's difficult. It is very difficult, and and that's why wherever possible, it's probably the best outcome is to try and keep people out of a system because you. you I'd be willing to say that there's probably the vast majority of day-to-day -day parents do something or other, I'm not talking about physical striking the charts, something that could be spun negatively in a family court. Absolutely. I would say probably 90% of parents have done something at some other or a time. And uh, it's a similar thing um, when I think about uh, adoption. I have a friend here in the UK and he, he and his husband are thinking about adopting and when i talk to them about the procedures that they're going to have to go through mm. that i know that many heterosexual couples would fail <laughs> it gives the similar kind of thought process of thinking actually we need to operate and utilize these systems in a reasonable way because mm. i do think 
a lot of parents have probably done something along their tenure as parents that then if someone chose to drag into family court would be viewed very negatively because everything is under a microscope to an extreme degree. So I do think it's a very difficult question. And the, realistically, the only way to counter that is to not get involved in it in the first place, wherever possible, and to only go when there is a significant kind of risk to the child rather than just as a default, which I think a lot of people are doing now. Yeah, completely agree. There's a situation that was along those lines and not for myself and my daughter, but my mom had said once to my daughter when she was a child that she would discipline her or do something along those lines. And mm. my daughter retorted, I can, I'll just call the yes, child protective yeah, services. Child line, yeah. 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 Well, where'd you get that idea from? This is yeah. like just a normal parenting and grandparenting kind of comment. And yet mm. she came back with a, oh no, that's, mm. you're, you're taking it out of context. And somewhere the child gets the idea that I'm going to use mm. what you're saying, the court system and the authorities to come down on what would be like that sort of normal, ordinary 90% of parenting or grandparenting is that's all it is. Mm. Mm. Last question to wrap up for this session today or this part, and hopefully we'll be able to have you back on Ben. But you reference many theories of why alienation behavior starts with one parent. Some of them include attention seeking or strong need for validation, unresolved emotional issues, perceived threat and fear of the other parent, revenge, even technology. Now these days, social media and things influence or coercive control, just to name a couple. Mm. Are there any that you find that are more prevalent than others? Unfortunately, and I allude to this in the book, it's very difficult to um, realistically answer that question. And actually, a lot of the, the things you've read out in the area of trying to understand this is, is very, they're very conjectural. They come from lots of tidbits, personal experience, a smattering of studies that have very varying methodologies. And the reason for that is because it's very hard to get hold of alienating parents who are willing to put their hand up and go, yeah, I'm an alienating parent. Let me tell you about why I do it. Now that in and of itself might serve as a function of one of the things that I is listed on there in terms of personality disorder, because one of the things that has been highlighted is that there is a potential prevalence amongst alienating parents of those kind of cluster B personality disorders, so narcissistic personality disorder, which in and of themselves, we uh, limit that self-awareness. It's this maybe self-fulfilling cycle of someone with that personality type engaging in, alien in alienating behavior, either without realizing they're doing so, or doing so with kind of no, I don't know how to phrase it, no kind of regret, because they believe, they genuinely believe they're doing the right thing, mm -hmm. uh, coupled with, probably a very healthy, I would probably argue minority that are fueled purely by acrimony and revenge and et cetera, things like that. But it's very difficult to answer that question in any meaningful way because we can't, unlike alienated parents and children who are alienated, who are now adults and other groups, grandparents, et cetera, who are very clearly identifiable and identify themselves in terms of their experience of those behaviors, it's very hard to get hold of them. But the stuff that we do have does suggest that it may be that personality typologies that are feeding into that. But we you know do also- with that though, on. Ben? Yeah. Is that we understand it as targeted parents. We understand that they might not be doing it purposefully. You, you mm. made a great point there. And yeah. they might not even realize they're doing it because they think they're doing the best thing. So if we can switch our mind to- put ourselves in that position and not be so yeah. angry and hold resentment, yeah. but more understanding. Yeah. And, that, that, and that's what I said in the book. Us. Yeah. And, that, and, and I do think that is liberating in a way because yes. you can then, yeah, maybe approach it in a different mindset. And this is what I made a, there's a subsection in the book in this section about alienating parents saying it's important to 
come at this from a position of understanding rather than blame. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of, if we try and understand why people alienate, a lot of it is around fear, not in terms of fear of, of the partner, but fear of abandonment, mm -hmm. fear of rejection, mm -hmm. a lot of which is attachment trauma-based itself. So often it's part of this intergenerational cycle where you have attachment trauma going up between the parents of the alienated ting parent that they then replicate downwards towards their own child. And that's where you get the enmeshment. That's where you get those kind of behaviors, which are all the result of that panic, that attachment based panic and fear of loss and abandonment and rejection. And if we operate by the principle, which I really like, which is hurt people. Mm -hmm. So those who have experienced trauma in the past and more like to go on and hurt others is if you just try again as an alienated parent to think about what might be fueling the behavior, because unless you do, so, it can seem incomprehensible and mm -hmm. it can seem illogical. And that's because a lot of the time it is illogical because mm -hmm. you might look at someone and you might go, I just how can this person logically say these things about me when they've experienced me and my behavior and I thought that we were in love and all these separate things that you might think and that's because you're maybe not dealing with necessarily although there are those who are what we might couch as more malicious alienators but a lot of the time it's not accidental but not malicious if it's somewhere yeah. but whatever descriptor we want to put on that it's yeah. more based on that person's own issues and, and I, I mean I have my own attachment trauma to deal with and I've seen that manifest sometimes with my kids and how I interact with them and luckily because my partner has been we've been together throughout our whole lives essentially she's really good at dealing with that because she knows where it's coming from whereas if I had met someone in the last couple of years and had kids with them and they had no idea about my backstory they'd be like how on earth where would this like how on earth do you think this is okay way to speak to a child or do this or do that so I think if we can understand people rather than blame them as difficult as it can be, I think sometimes that can be really helpful, but very difficult sometimes. On that same topic, how parental alienation affects children mm -hmm. and how you should not hold the child at fault, their child, mm -hmm. even if they grow up to be an adult without seeing the truth. So mm -hmm. how does that process take place? Don't blame the children it's really difficult and it's it's really difficult because I, I couldn't imagine how frustrated and hurt look I'm not the right person to talk about this because I get upset if my kids on a whim just jokingly say they love their mum more that's my attachment trauma issue so I, I'm I'm like oh my god I've never been more hurt don't, don't look at me, don't talk to me. So that's stuff I've had to work on. And then if you have a child who's like wholesale rejecting you, doesn't want any contact, and this is a child who to whom you personally have either shown or want to show nothing but love, that that's incredibly difficult. But you have to the best way to think about parental alienation is within this within attachment theory. And that's one of the first things that really comes up in the book is looking at parental alienation as an attack on attachment. Now, just very quickly, when children are born, they're evolutionary, biologically programmed to, to establish safety around them because human infants are really bad infants. Yeah, they, don't, they can't fend for themselves like lots of other mammalian infants can. So they have specific processes in place, crying, etc., to get people around them. And then very quickly, between two months all the way up to two years, that's a really key time period where children are looking around and they're building up a cognitive representation of safety in their environment because they're thinking, okay, this person seems to be responding every time I cry. This person seems to be coming. They build that up and that forms their working model of attachment, which they can then use as a safe base. So attachment is about safety. Parental alienation is an attack on that safety. And we're not talking necessarily just about, okay, I'm safe because I'm in a room and I'm in a building. It's psychological safety. It's the mm -hmm. safety to know that wherever you are, whatever setting you're in, you've got the psychological safety of people looking out for you and looking after you. 
So if you then take one of those actors and you say to that child, you know that person who's keeping you safe, they're actually really dangerous and they might hurt you and they're not actually safe. That for me is one of the most psychologically damaging and cruelest things you can do to a child. So when we talk about parental alienation and the effect on children, it's really hard to undersell the profundity of that effect. And it would be right up there with serious child sexual abuse, other forms of really extreme deprivation and emotional abuse, because you're just disrupting all of the good work that child has done in order to build up their sense of psychological safety. Mm. And then when you add into that, that you're then like constantly playing around with that safety. Then the uncertainty that might come, if they then get exposure to that person and see that they are safe, then they don't know what's true. Mm -hmm. And if anything, that's even more damaging because then they just don't know what to believe and who to trust. And that's where you get this kind of complete insecure attachment kind of formulations. And I've worked very hard in order to try and put myself in a position where I can form healthy attachments to my children. And I hope that I am doing that. But it's required a hell of a lot of work because fundamentally, I don't have an anchor. And I still feel that way to, to, quite, a certain, to quite a large degree. Even though I'm here and I have my wife who I love dearly and I have my kids, there's still a tiny part of me that feels adrift because that is a, that's a psychological scar that I have because I never really knew who was anchoring me above. Mm. Were there parents in the fold who were anchoring me? So that's why it's so damaging to children. There's a whole list of effects in the book, in the child chapter about all the different ways that can manifest. But fundamentally, it manifests through loss. You lose a good enough parent, you lose your self-esteem, you lose your identity, you lose all of these things. I'm 34 now. I'm only just starting to understand who I am. Mm. And most people at least have some good, good go at that in their teens and their 20s. I just had nothing to build on. And then because my mum died as well, it was just I was working from zilch. Whereas my wife, for example, she grew up her parents, very stable, fine. She knows she's safe. So she's just steady, calm, knows she's loved. Doesn't get freaked out if the kids show me more affection one day or the other because she's fine. She just knows. And it's that baseline, that kind of sense of psychological safety that you're taking away from an alienated child. It's, it's, it's not just the case of, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, they heard their dad being called a this or a that. Oh, it can't be that bad. No, that isn't. That's probably fine. When you're alienating and you're doing all of these things, campaign of denigration, controlling contact instilling a fear of the other parent those are all hugely damaging and i'm it, it when you really get into it it makes you amazed that it's not more of an issue on more people's radars but that's why we're here right that's why we're doing it yes that's exactly why we're here and i think that's what's so frustrating for many of us is why it's not recognized that it's so psychologically damaging sometimes just as much as physical trauma yeah. that kids might go through or abuse it, it, this is just as bad if not even worse or the same if, if not worse just want it to be recognized yeah yeah because and a lot of uh, adult victims of domestic abuse say look broken bones heal but emotional fear of leaving my front door that'll never go mm -hmm. we don't like to get into this hierarchy of abuse uh, stuff in the literature yeah it's really damaging Ben, thank you so much. I look forward to exploring a little bit more about how that is psychologically yeah. and emotionally damaging to children as we explore more in the book. So thank you for being on today. It's I'll be back. Amazing. For part two, I'll be back. Fantastic. Yeah. So we'll look <laughs> we look forward to it. <laughs> Thanks for your time today. You. And yeah, it's not if, but when, because yes, we definitely when. Want. Thank, you. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you. you bet. If you enjoyed that episode as much as I did, and I'm sure Kendra did as well, yes, we've got to get Ben back because this is just a great episode. But until that next time, hopefully you learned something because I certainly did and everyone else. But if you want, please, if you want to keep these episodes coming, subscribe, share, and positively review The Aftermath, especially on Apple Podcasts. That helps us a great deal. So until next Nick, time. I'm going to add before next time, yes, before yes. the part two of Ben, 
Yes. He Let's is. have the listeners go on Amazon and purchase the book, Parental Alienation a Guide for Parents, Practitioners, and Policymakers by Ben, Professor Ben Hine. Amazing. And that's what we want to say. Sometimes people don't plug things, but we will. We'll plug movies. We'll plug books because we have no shame. It's selfless, shameful promotion. Yes, indeed. But it's really good. And I appreciate the comments that you're yes. making, Kendra. Yes, yes. indeed. Let's go bring get awareness that to this. Every, educate bring everybody. Awareness. That's why we're here. Like Ben said, that's why we're here. Thanks again for listening. Until next time. And we see Ben and other episodes. Day is full. <laughs>